Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to have a look at a bill that's been introduced in the States. Now, I don't normally look at American law much, but I'm going to look at this one because it's a really bad bill. Uh, previously, it was introduced and failed, but it's being reintroduced, possibly in the hopes of finding a more favorable political climate. Uh, this one is H.R. 127, which is listed as the Sabika Sheik Firearms Licensing and Registration Act. Again, this is a really bad bill, so I'm going to have a drink while I go through this, and you might want to as well. Uh, for the Americans who might watch this, uh, I'll have some commentary on how this differs from Canada's laws, because in Canada we do have a licensing scheme, but it's not as bad as this one proposes. So let's uh, have a look here. As noted, uh, Sabika Sheik Firearms Licensing and Registration Act is uh, sort of the short title. If you're wondering who that is, um, that's a dead child, and this is usually a giveaway for a bad law. Most laws named for dead children are terrible laws because laws make very poor monuments. You know, when we're grieving, we want to do something, and often that response is, well, we should make a law. But typically those laws are not very well thought out. They tend to be overbroad, overreaching. Um, they tend to be laws that nobody would really give a second look at if they weren't sort of waving that flag. So that's our sort of starting point here. Now it proposes to set up both a licensing system and a registration system. I'm going to jump uh, right away to this section, section three, because it is really one that will affect a lot of how we look at the uh, registration information. So it specifies database. The Attorney General shall establish and maintain a database of all firearms registered pursuant to the subsection, which, if you're wondering, is all firearms. Uh, access. The Attorney General shall make the contents of the database accessible to all members of the public, all federal, state, and local law enforcement authorities, all branches of the United States Armed Forces, and all state and local governments as defined by the Bureau. So you might be thinking, well, why does the armed forces need this information? But that's not the one that I just go, whoa, all members of the public. Yeah. All right, let's have a look at what's in this. Uh, required information. Under the firearm registration system, uh, the owner of a firearm shall transmit to the Bureau the make, model, and serial number of the firearm, the identity of the owner of the firearm, the date the firearm was acquired by the owner, and where the firearm is or will be stored, and if it's been loaned to a person, you know, who it's been loaned to and for how long. So every gun will then be in a database where you can look up not only who owns it, but also where it is. So if you're a thief looking to steal firearms, this is a shopping list. You can go through this and, you know, whatever you happen to feel like you want. You know, if you decide you want a particular make and model, well, you can just plug it in and look at where you go. You know, here's a list of addresses for where you could go to get one of these. And then, you know, after that, you just go about your business of thievery. But let's say you're not looking for a firearm. Let's say you are looking for a place to commit a home invasion or a burglary and you really want to know that you're going to be safe while you do it. Well, you just plug in that, you know, the house address and say, hey, look, no guns there. It's a perfect place to go, you know, and if I bring my gun, I know that I'll be the only one. I'll be safe in my home invasion. I, I can't see how this was thought out. This is a terrible idea. You know, it's one thing to have a registration system, but it's another thing entirely to make that registration system open to the public. That's lunacy. Canada's got a firearm registration or system. It used to be for non-restricted firearms and restricted firearms. They've now cut it down to, well, and also prohibited firearms. They've now cut it down to just restricted firearms and prohibited firearms. Uh, so that for the Americans who might not be familiar with those terms, uh, they basically excluded most long guns from the, uh, from the registry. But that's not a public facing registry because why would you ever make that a public facing document? Uh, the other thing is that in the course of our firearm training, 
they actually advise you not to sort of brag that you have firearms and especially brag that you have firearms and where they're stored. Uh, it goes a step further. Uh, your firearms license here in Canada is one of the documents that notwithstanding that it's an ID document doesn't have your address on it. And that's a deliberate choice. The reason why they've left out your address from that uh, card is on the assumption that if you lose that card somewhere and somebody finds it, it doesn't immediately give them an address for where they can go to steal firearms. That was an intentional choice and it makes sense. So this notion of requiring all of this to be in a public facing database is just bizarre to me. And this is one of those situations where it's pretty clear somebody didn't sit down and sort of hash out the likely outcomes of that because it'd be terrible. Um, you also have to think that the people who want this particular law, they want it because they want to limit the number of firearms out there. They want to restrict guns. But this also creates a bit of a perverse incentive because if you start getting burglars who are looking at this database in order to say, where can we rob safely that won't have a gun? Well, that creates a tremendous incentive to buy a gun because now you can signal to the burglars in the world who are using this database, don't come here, rob my neighbor, he's got no guns. You know, you'd see a lot of people who might be really stridently anti-gun buying one anyway, just, you know, for the same reason you put out a, uh, you know, a sign warning that you've got a burglar alarm. This is, I, I'm not sure that they thought about this at all. All right, continuing on, we're going to go to the licensing system. Now, Canada's got a licensing system. You've got to apply for a license because we don't have a Second Amendment right to have firearms. The whole idea of a licensing system for a right is a bit of a, you know, bit of an issue here. But uh, the licensing system that they're proposing is really bad. And I say this as a Canadian where we have very strict rules. So let's uh, look at what they say. Except as otherwise provided in this subsection, the Attorney General shall issue to an individual a license to possess a firearm and ammunition if the individual... Now, lots of people will be hearing that and going, shall issue, excellent, that's what I want to hear in a gun law. Don't get too excited because they're going to put a whole lot of caveats on that shall, and it really starts sounding more like a may by the time they're done with it. So first, has attained 21 years of age. I see a problem there right already because, you know, people who are younger than 21 may well need a firearm. They may well, for instance, go hunting in order to feed their families. Uh, Canada explicitly provides for young people to be able to have firearms in some cases for that purpose. And we're a pretty restrictive country because, you know, a lot of families might be struggling. They might be relying on hunted meat in order to help sustain themselves. Uh, it also seems unusual that you'd take a fundamental right and cap it off at 21, but I'm not a U.S. constitutional law scholar. I don't know how well that particular bit would hold up, but just in terms of being a good idea, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Again, you know, 16-year-old hunters, I don't have a problem with. I don't see why they need that. But the next section gets even worse. So after applying for the license, uh, one undergoes a criminal background check conducted by the uh, National Instant Criminal Background Check System, and that comes back as okay, essentially. So Canada has a background check system when you get a license, and that's actually one of the only things I like about our licensing system, which is that it front ends a background check. Um, so what that means is that once I have that uh, license, I can go and buy a shotgun or, you know, at a firearms, uh, you know, store and not have to worry about it a great deal. They're not going to do another background check. They're just going to check that my license is good and then I can walk out with the shotgun. I've done this. But they're not proposing to just front end the background check. They're proposing to ha do a background check when you get the license, but still keep all the other background checks, which maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Uh, the next part is undergoes a psychological evaluation conducted in accordance with paragraph two, and the evaluation does not indicate that the individual is psychologically unsuited to possess a firearm. 
So let's jump ahead and just look at what all is involved in this psychological evaluation, because as you can gather, it's probably going to be a little wild. So psychological evaluation. A psychological evaluation is conducted in accordance with this paragraph if A. Conducted in compliance with such standards as shall be established by the Attorney General, which means we don't know at this stage what those standards will be. They can sort of tweak that as they see fit. And so when we start talking about shall, this starts looking at a lot more like may if they establish very strict standards. B. The evaluation is conducted by a licensed psychologist approved by the Attorney General. We'll come back to that in just a second. C, as deemed necessary by the licensed psychologist involved, the evaluation included a psychological evaluation of other members of the household in which the individual resides. So not only do you have to get an exam, but other people in the house also need to get an exam and, you know, have to agree to that. That's a little heavy. D, as part of the psychological evaluation, the licensed psychologist interviewed any spouse of the individual, any former spouse of the individual, Better hope your ex is all like you, and better hope there aren't too many of them. And at least two other persons who are a member of the family of or an associate of the individual to further determine the state of mental, emotional, and relational stability of the individual in relation to firearms. Now, when you hear licensed psychologist, and not just a licensed psychologist, but a subset of licensed psychologists that are the ones approved by the attorney general... Well, first, uh, they might easily just say, well, we're going to only approve ones that are anti-gun and that, you know, don't believe in people having firearms. But the second thing is licensed psychologists are expensive. So this right here is a giant uh, fee system, essentially, because you should expect that that licensed psychologist is going to cost you not in the hundreds of dollars, but probably in the thousands of dollars. So can you enjoy your Second Amendment rights in the States? Well, that'll depend on the thickness of your wallet. I see that as a really big problem here, because if we're talking about that as a right, uh, suddenly saying you can't enjoy that right unless you spend 2000 bucks for, you know, a psychological evaluation. And that's probably on the low side. Um, that seems to me to be very difficult to justify. So... This is very much an anti-poor people having guns kind of law. And it was introduced by a Democrat, and normally they don't sort of like to wave the flag of, we hate poor people. But that's very much what this is aimed at uh, when you look at the effect. The effect is going to be to target the poorest people, uh, in, which will systematically be marginalized people, and say, you can't have a gun because you can't afford it. So that's a big problem here. Uh, going back up here, uh, there is a successfully completes a training course certified by the Attorney General in the use, safety, and storage of firearms that includes at least 24 hours of training. Now, Canada has a training program uh, set up for getting a firearms license. It doesn't take 24 hours worth of time, because if you think about it, you're not going to get 24 hours worth of time done in one day. That's going to be multiple days. Uh, Canada's, I think, is 16 hours, and to be honest, it's probably longer than it needs to be. This is, again, a bit of a, a sort of a tax on people. Do you have the spare time to take this course? Can you afford to take this course? Because if you're talking about 24 hours of training, you're talking about somebody having to do the training and, you know, paying them for 24 hours of work or for your share of 24 hours of work is going to be a lot of money. So we have another thing here that is designed to disenfranchise the poor from having firearms and demonstrates that on issuance of the license, the individual will have an effect an insurance policy issued under subsection D. So they require an insurance policy and let's go to subsection D to have a look at that. All right here, and this is all the way down here. Firearms insurance. The Attorney General shall issue to any person who has applied for a license pursuant to subsection C and has paid to the Attorney General the fee specified in paragraph 2 of this subsection, a policy that ensures the person against liability for losses and damages resulting from the use of any firearm by the person during the one-year period that begins with the date the policy is issued. And the fee specified in this paragraph is $800. So, um... Again, we see a fee attached to this, so $800 per year, 
in order to have the privilege... Oh, wait, wasn't it supposed to be a right in the States? Well, now it's a privilege of having firearms. This also ends up being a really weird section because what it... You know, first, this in, usually the idea of insurance is that it sort of... You're going to have to pay an amount for the insurance that corresponds with your risk. You know, an adjuster is going to uh, assess your risk and if you are a riskier individual, then you'll have to pay more. The problem with that is they don't want that. The reason why is because we have access to liability insurance for fire misuse here in Canada. And the fees for that are tend to be around like 25 bucks because gun owners are not uh, typically uh, a particular danger to society, at least not the licensed ones here in Canada, the people who are trying to follow the law. However, uh, this seems to be proposing a licensing scheme that goes beyond any, or an insurance scheme that goes beyond any of the insurance available in Canada. Because if you want to buy insurance in Canada, it's going to cover, you know, accidental firearm incidents. It's not going to cover intentional firearm misuse for the obvious reason that no insurer wants to cover an, you know, an, a specifically intended murder, for example. You know, if you go over to the house of somebody you don't like and you shoot them in the face, your insurer doesn't want to cover that because that's your bad action. But this essentially makes the government the insurer for all of those bad actions because there doesn't appear to be any exclusion provision here uh, for that. So if somebody goes and this person has no money, you know, it's somebody who's just living out of their car but they decide, you know, I'm going to rob a bank. And in the course of robbing that bank, they use their gun and they shoot somebody in the face and that person dies. Well, now the liability for that is on the insurance policy, assuming that they had, you know, one of these insurance policies. Do we really want to make the government on the hook for every criminal use of firearms? I'm not sure they thought that one through. Normally the government likes to exclude itself from liability for things, especially exclude itself for liability for things that they didn't actually do. It's rare that you see a government sort of specifically and intentionally pointing a gun at its own head in this fashion. So this one, again, makes no sense to me as to why the government would want to start adopting liability for this. I mean, if you're going to have a firearm insurance system, which you shouldn't, but if you're going to, really, this is a place to say, let's, you know, have market forces applying here. Let's have this with private companies. This, again, makes no sense to me whatsoever. So the insurance thing is just weird. All right, uh, let's uh, continue on here. They've got a provision for antique firearm display uh, license. Uh, this one, it's not really clear. You have to ask for a license and you have to describe it, the manner in which it'll be displayed and certify that it will be displayed in that fashion. I'm not sure if that's actually going to go into the database. If it goes into the database, that makes things even worse because it's here, I have a valuable firearm and here's exactly how it's stored, you know. Makes no sense to me, but uh, they also have another provision here for a military style weapons license. So there's the one tier of license for just having a firearm. And then there's another tier for military style weapons licenses. And this is basically going to import a lot of the language of the previous assault weapons ban. So continuing on, uh, this one requires uh, that you already have a license under the first section and that you complete another training course which includes at least 24 hours of training and live fire training. Again, really ramping up the costs here. Now I'm just jumping up a little bit here, back to the firearm registration system. Uh, something I meant to cover, but I missed. Deadline for supplying information. So you have to provide this information either in the case of a firearm acquired before the effective date of this section, within three months after the effective date of this section. So you got a three month window to get them all this information for the guns you currently have. And in the case of a firearm acquired on or after the effective date, on the date the owner acquires the firearm. Now, look at the stuff we've got to provide, the make, model, and serial number of the firearm. That's gonna be relatively easy. Identity of the owner of the firearm, also not such a big deal. The date the firearm was acquired by the owner. 
Now, if you ask me to go through the firearms I have and tell you what day I acquired each one, I certainly couldn't do it. Uh, for many of them, I couldn't even give you a ballpark. You know, I got this at some point. I'm not really sure when. Um, I put it in my safe and, you know, I take it out whenever I feel like it, but I don't really know when I got it. So that's going to create a real problem for a lot of people if this went through, because how do you figure all that out? Would they allow you to just sort of pick a day? <sighs> this law is full of terrible in all sorts of ways. So let's look a little bit at what they're defining as a military style weapon. Um, any of the firearms or copies or duplicates of the firearms in any caliber. Uh, this is similar to some of the regulations we see in Canada where they talk about variants. However, I like their definition better than I like variants because variant is incredibly unclear. But uh, Norenko, Mitchell, and Polytechnologies AKs, all, uh, all models. The Uzi and Galil, AR-70, AR-15, FN Fal, uh, Sterog, Tech-9, bunch of others. Revolving cylinder shotguns. I'm not sure why that was such a big, uh, big concern for them. A semi-automatic rifle that has an ability to accept a detachable magazine and two features of folding or telescoping stock, pistol grip, uh, bayonet mount, flash suppressor or threaded barrel, or grenade launcher. Semi-automatic pistol that can accept a detachable magazine and has two of magazine that attaches outside the pistol grip, threaded barrel, uh, a barrel shroud. Again, they're really concerned about barrel shrouds for some reason. I've never understood this one because it goes on to tell you what a barrel shroud does. And it's not a shoulder thing that goes up. Uh, that is attached to or partially or completely encircles the barrel and that permits the shooter to hold the firearm with the non-trigger hand without being burned. Literally a safety feature that prevents burning. Manufactured weight of 50 ounces or more when the pistol is unloaded. I'm not sure why you'd care about the weight here, especially because a fair number of sort of target design pistols are heavy so that the pistol itself can eat recoil. And a semi-automatic version of an automatic firearm, which is super unclear. I'm sure that the courts won't be spending a ton of time determining that one. All right. Uh, a semi-automatic shotgun that has at least two of a folding or telescoping stock. A pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the weapon. Fixed magazine capacity in excess of five rounds. And an ability to accept a detachable magazine. So, again, uh, they sort of have these features that they're looking at. A lot of these are ergonomic features. Some of them are safety features. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Now, we get into the prohibition section. And so it talks about it's unlawful for a person to possess firearms or ammunition unless the person is carrying a valid license issued under the section. So you better hope that you don't forget your wallet at home or else you're looking at some serious time. And in the case of a firearm, it has to be registered to another person or that is owned by another person. It has to be registered and you have to have notified the attorney general that it's been loaned. Better hope the attorney general keeps good paperwork because otherwise you're on the hook. And let's look at some of the penalties here for. So the penalties for those sections find not less than 75 grand and not more than 150 grand imprison not less than 15 years. 15 years is the minimum and not more than 25 years or both. So they can inflict you with both penalties together. That's a hell of a punishment for, you know, if your firearms license expires. You know, can you imagine you forget to renew your firearms license and now you're on the hook for 15 years in prison? That to me seems like it's a bit of a, you know... Even considering that the U.S. has much stricter penalties for criminal offenses as a general rule, uh, 15 years for forgetting to renew your paperwork, to my mind, seems insane. Uh, unlawful to transfer a firearm or ammunition to a person who's not licensed. And for some reason, the penalty for that is not less than 50 grand and not more than 75 grand and imprisoned for not less than 10 years and not more than 15 years. So the penalty for actually engaging in the weapons trafficking offense that they have here is less than the penalty for illegally possessing it. 
okay. Um, I'm not sure why they do that. Um, if you don't have the insurance policy, uh, the fine is 50 grand or up to a hundred grand and 10 years as a minimum and 20 years as a maximum uh, imprisonment. That's a hell of a thing. Uh, the also we'll look at the renewal of licenses because you know, when you renew a license, there's a process for that. You have to request, request the renewal by the end of the 60 day period that begins with the uh, date the license expires. And in the three year period ending with the date, uh, the renewal is requested. You have to have met uh, the requirements and have completed a training course that includes uh, at least eight hours of training. So again, back to the wallet for eight hours of training every time you renew your license. And if you've got a uh, the military weapons license, uh, you have to have also completed a training course that includes at least eight hours of training for that, as well as, yeah. So again, Coming back to the wallet. They're going to hit you repeatedly in the wallet if this goes through. I can't imagine that a lot of this uh, could be found to be constitutional under the U.S. Uh, scheme. Because, again, I'm not a U.S. constitutional law expert. But it seems to me when you are imposing these kinds of fees for the exercise of a right, that's going to be seen as a problem. But I'm not going to speak too, uh, too strongly on that one because, again, not a U.S. constitutional law expert. But they also want to ban some things in the course of this, and we should have a look at that as well. So, shall be unlawful for any person to possess ammunition that is 50 cal or greater. So they're looking at things like, you know, 50 caliber uh, BMG rifles, which of course are used in homicides almost never, because most murders are, you know, committed with firearms that you can sort of smuggle in your jacket or tuck down the front of your pants. And nobody is tucking a 50 BMG rifle down the front of their pants. Uh, those rifles tend to be almost as tall as I am. They tend to be very heavy because they've got to eat a lot of recoil. So they're not typically used for murders. Um, they're used by people who like, you know, long distance target shooting by and large. So this one doesn't make any sense. Now, have you spotted the real problem with this one? Because maybe you can say, you know what, I don't really care about the 50 BMG rifle. But unless I'm misreading this somehow, unless shotgun slugs are somehow excluded, a shotgun slug for a 12 gauge is significantly greater than 50 caliber. So they're suddenly going to say it's illegal to possess shotgun slugs for 12 gauges and many other gauges of shotguns. Okay, um... I'm pretty sure that wasn't what they meant to do, but maybe it was. Maybe, you know, I don't know, but it seems to me that that makes no sense. It shall be unlawful for any person to possess a large capacity ammunition feeding device. And so they exempt themselves from that. So shall not apply for use of the United States or department or agency of the United States, etc., etc. Employees or contractors are the same. Uh, but they define a large capacity uh, ammunition feeding device as a magazine belt drum feed strip or similar device that has a capacity of or that can be readily restored or converted to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition, but does not include an attached tubular device designed to accept and capable of operating only with 22 caliber rimfire device or rimfire ammunition. So ton of magazines go out the uh, the window here. I'm not sure why they specify that it has to be a tubular device for 22 caliber rimfire ammunition, uh, but it notes that it has to be attached. Note how this would affect uh, belts and linked ammunition, because if it can be converted to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition, so if you can clip the links together and make a link longer than 10, that would be banned. Yeah, um, there is so much bad in this law, and I say this as a Canadian where we have to deal with, you know, fairly strict laws. Um, here in Canada, we have restrictions on most uh, rifle magazines that cap them at five rounds. But those restrictions specify certain means that you can pin a magazine 
that make it legal, even if the original design was for a larger, uh, larger capacity. But many of those would still run afoul of this based on the possibility of being restored or converted. Uh, it would be very difficult to modify most magazines in a way where they couldn't be restored or converted to accept uh, more than 10 rounds of ammunition. So this is, this is a huge problem. This bill represents a major attack on, you know, U.S. Uh, firearm rights. And so much of it is so very, very poorly thought out. And I say this, you know, as somebody who comes from the land of poorly thought out gun laws. Anyway, thank you for watching. This has been a bit of a ranty, uh, ranty video, but I don't think that this bill is likely to go anywhere. I suspect that cooler heads would look at it. Uh, particularly because firearm use is on the upswing, not just with Republicans in the U.S., but a lot of Democrats, a lot of left-leaning people are seeing the value in being armed. Um, there's a lot of expansion among the LGBT community, uh, as well as uh, expansion among you know people of color, people who are looking at the the world around them and saying, I don't necessarily feel safe, Maybe I should have the means to protect myself. Maybe I should have the means to protect my loved ones. So there's a lot of people now on the left in the U.S. who are very leery of this kind of restriction, especially, I would think, this kind of restriction that really aims to limit firearm ownership uh, to people of means. That's That's really... It's There's so many things here that... Uh, seem designed to increase the cost of firearm ownership, that it's very difficult, I would think, to make the argument that this wasn't an intentional uh, intentional aspect of it, that they're trying to make gun ownership expensive. In particular, when you see the firearm insurance is set at a specified amount instead of, you know, market rate, there, it's a tax. It's a tax on the right is really what it comes down to. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you found this to be interesting or educational. If you have, uh, please like this video. It helps. Uh, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe if you want to see more content. Um, as noted, I mostly cover uh, Canadian legal topics. I also want to thank uh, my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, D. Mo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Farms Association, and Kyle Martin. At the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Kevin Fleet, Dale Nesbitt, and Andrew Elsich as well as a number of you who will be at the uh, in the crawl immediately following at the $10 level. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge, and I hope you had a drink for this one, because it's a hell of a bill that they're trying to go with here. All right. Have a good night.